Please welcome Finchon O'Toole and Misha Glenny. Hello, everybody. I'm really sorry I'm not there with you in corporeal form. Um, I had fully intended to be, but um, it turned out to be rather more difficult to get um, out of and back into the United States than, than I had anticipated. And I'm particularly sorry not to be uh, there with, with, with Misha, um, who is someone that um, I've admired hugely for, for, for many, many years. Um, Misha Glenny, as you know, is is arguably you know one of the one of the greatest uh, journalists working in the world really over over the last uh, few decades um most people i suppose would have become aware of him uh, as a result of his brilliant reporting from the balkans in the 1990s and his 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 equally superb book on the subject um and um he's been particularly pioneering um since then in opening up this whole dark world of international crime. Um, people, I'm sure, have seen the, the TV series based on, on, on his book, Mac Mafia. Um, uh, but 10 years ago, um, Misha wrote a brilliant book about cybercrime, uh, which was then, I suppose, not, not, not nearly as um, prominent in our consciousness as it is now. Um, that book called Dark Market, I think, was published in in, in the autumn of 2011. Um, and it's to that subject that we're going to return today. Um, and um, I suppose, Misha, Katrina mentioned the cyber attack on the health service executive in Ireland. Um, did it surprise you when you read about it, that uh, cybercrime gang would target a national health service in the middle of a global pandemic? Um, it did surprise me, yes, Fintan. That's the, the short answer. And uh, the reason for that is, is we had seen in the previous year, from about the beginning of when everyone became conscious of the pandemic as a big thing in March 2020, uh, what we saw was a withdrawal of attacks on health services and health uh, facilities except for um, research institutes. And there was a lot of espionage um, uh, using, using cyber in uh, institutes, in uh, big pharma, there, um, there were attempts to get into big farmers systems all it was thought uh, in order to gather data about uh, a the sociology of the pandemic and and b the science uh, behind it and what one could do to combat it so immediately when that happened suspicion fell on the chinese uh, as possibly being behind this, as they have a long track record stretching back 15 to 20 years uh, of basically nicking anything they can um, through network computer systems without, however, trying to um, bully or intimidate those people they were, they were stealing from. Um, it's possible also that Russia was looking to see what was happening in the pandemic a, a, around the world. But there was a reduction in the number of attacks on uh, actual health uh, healthcare fac facilities. Now, uh, the attack on the Irish um, health executive happened fairly soon after the uh, another very important attack this year, and that was the attack on Colonial Pipeline. And there's a reason why I introduced Colonial Pipeline straight away, because Colonial Pipeline was the first major uh, attack with real-world uh, impact uh, on part of the critical, so-called critical national infrastructure of the United States. Colonial Pipeline was responsible for the distribution of 45% of the uh, oil moving up and down the east coast of uh, the United States. So that is actually a, 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 absolutely a, a major event when America's um, infrastructure gets attacked so brazenly for the first time. And what happened with that 
was that very quickly uh, the attackers, who were a group called Dark Side, um, withdrew. They, uh, they um, secured a, a small amount of ransom, about $4 million, which is a small amount in this context, uh, most of which uh, was, then, uh, was then recovered. And what it looked like, uh, and what I'm fairly sure happened in that case, was that Dark Side was operating out of a country that was either Russia or influenced by Russia, and the American government got in touch with the Russian government and said, uh, pull this very quickly, otherwise there will be consequences. And so I, I think that the Russian government, the intelligence services, told Dark Side to move back, because anything to do with critical national infrastructure is a state issue and not a criminal issue. So when the attack on uh, the Irish health system uh, took place, what was interesting about this is that you didn't have um, an immediate response when it was clear that it was the, uh, that it was the health service. Now, uh, obviously, the Irish government, if they were trying to... Um, uh, if they were trying to pressurize the Russian government, they don't have as much influence as the United States does. Nonetheless, if the attack had emanated from Russia, it would look very bad on Moscow if it was attacking uh, a health service of a, what is essentially a friendly, neutral country like Ireland. Um, and so the, the attack on the Irish health service is one of the things which convinced people that Conti, who is the, um, or Wizard Spider, as it was first called, Conti, which was the group behind this attack, was probably not operating out of Russian territory, that it really was a freelance, well-disguised um, organization. And one of the things that happens with ransomware groups like Conti which is one of the top two ransomware organizations, the other being a group called Revil, which is uh, uh, well known by people in the cybersecurity business. One of the things about Conti is, is that it pays less attention to its reputation than other groups do. So <clears throat> many of these criminal gangs present themselves as legitimate businesses, and when they attack somebody, they try and pretend that they're very friendly when it comes to dealing with the problem of releasing the data that they have kidnapped and the payment of, of money, which will resolve the issue. But Conti tend not to do that. Nonetheless, even Conti, I think, thought that attacking the health service of a country like Ireland was probably a bit beyond the pale. And so you had this mysterious offer to decrypt material, some of which, as I understand, has been released on the, on the dark net, decrypt the material without the Irish government having to pay. That, at least, is the narrative which the Irish government holds to, and it would appear Conti, Conti does as well. Now, whether there were other things at play, I don't know. I suspect there probably were behind the scenes, but we're unlikely ever to, to know about them. But the reason why this is, attack is so important is that when it comes to healthcare, the real world con consequences are very dramatic and they tend to go on for a long time. So Ireland is still recovering from this attack, Irish patients. And unlike in other businesses, for example, if you were, say, the manufacturer of uh, chip technology and you had a particularly effective uh, design for a chip, you would keep that chip technology as your crown jewels uh, on a computer system that was completely unlinked to the internet so that, that uh, your crown jewels were always safe, you could be attacked, but the secret to your success remains secret. The problem with a health service is, is that you have to have a lot of the data about your customers, in inverted commas, i.e. your patients, available and readily uh, available 
And so when a health service gets attacked, then it immediately affects uh, all of the patients um, who, are, you know, who are serviced by that, by that health executive. And so this was uh, uh, one of the most dramatic um, attacks of the last two years, I would say, one of the most important because it demonstrates to us the level of vulnerability that we all suffer from by dint of our extreme dependence on networked computer systems in virtually every walk of life. Absolutely, and, and we'll try and tease some more of that out, I think. Um, just, do you have any sense of who these people are? I mean, who who, who is Conti? What mm. kind of people are involved in it? How do they operate as a group? So w what happened was that from about 2008, 2009 onwards, uh, in particular, once uh, Bitcoin started to circulate, um, and also as traditional organized crime gangs saw the emergence of a younger generation of leaders who were uh, digital natives. Uh, because for, for a long time, traditional organized crime groups like the Mafia or the Andrangheta were very resistant to becoming involved in cybercrime because, you know, like that generation all over the world, they didn't understand these new fangled things and they weren't particularly interested in them. But that younger generation coming up through organized crime realized that you could make a lot of money this way. So two things happened. First of all, in traditional organized crime uh, in the past decade, what we've seen is in every sphere of criminal activity, whether it's money laundering, whether it is trafficking people, whether it's um, a smuggling of drugs, whether it's the trafficking in endangered species, uh, whatever it is, there is, there is now a cyber component to it. It's called cyber-assisted crime. They're just making their business more efficient. But what you've also seen is, is that uh, you've had a shift in cyber criminality from the origins of the young individuals who are making money out of credit cards and that sort of thing it has become much, much organized along the lines of traditional organized crime. So Conti or Reval, uh, ransomware groups like this, uh, are in fact uh, properly organized businesses. They will have uh, people who are responsible for laundering the money. They will have people who are responsible for ensuring that the malware is deployed in a system, first of all, by using um, uh, so-called social engineering techniques, i.e. persuading people to, to press, on a, press on a link which will infect their computer. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and a lot of work now goes into social engineering because most people can see a fake email when it comes in. And so now what you will see, if you, if you look at the companies which have been targeted over the past year, most of them are medium-sized to big companies. And they all have a big presence on the net. And of course, all the people who work in those companies have a big social media presence. And so groups like Conti will spend a long time um, scoping out who the people who work for the companies are, what their habits are, what their uh, hobbies are, who they hang out with, what their vulnerabilities are, whether they appear to be gamblers, for example. Um, and they will use those as a way to create a, uh, a, a trick, a digital trick to get into the system. So you have the social engineers, you have the people who actually deploy the malware. Conti, it is believed, uh, uses the services of other ransomware groups which create the malware, deploy the malware, and they rent it out. This is called uh, uh, Malware as a Service, M-A-A-S. 
uh, which is sort of mirroring the, the, the thing that's going on in the legitimate cyber world of uh, software as a service and, and, and this sort of thing. So a group will contain uh, several divisions, each responsible for a different aspect, and they will target people. You cannot go into the health executive of Ireland without knowing that that's who you're targeting. So, you know, who, whoever they were, they cynically said, OK, let's hit, a, let's hit the, the Irish Health Service. Why do they do that? Partly because the data in itself is very valuable. They can sell it on the dark net. And partly uh, um, because they think that because it's essentially government-backed, then it has a bottomless pit and the government will feel obliged to cough up because it can't afford to have its, its health service network offline for longer than, you know, two or three days or whatever. I mean, we, we understand that the Irish government did not pay a ransom. <clears throat> so certainly, the, as you said, the, the, the narrative. Um, and probably, therefore, spent an awful lot more money trying to fix the problem than it would have done in, in, in paying a ransom. But presumably, the calculation for private companies is different, and 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 they must be paying. I mean, you know, the, this this ecosystem isn't going to thrive unless it's being watered all the time with money. And w would you reckon that most companies just make the business calculation that if we pay 10, 15, 20 million? It's worth it because otherwise the damage is is going to be multiples of that. It, well, it's interesting you asked that, Finland, because there was a case in in Dublin in June this year, in which <clears throat> a judge ruled that that a company which had played paid millions of euros, we don't know exactly how many, to a ransomware gang, um, should be allowed to retain its anonymity. Um, and not be exposed for having paid the ransom. Now, this is a very different approach to, say, the governments of the United Kingdom or the United States, who are along, along the lines of their old, uh, you know, approach to terrorists is you never pay the ransom. Uh, as you remember in, in Syria, all those, um, those uh, uh, British and uh, American journalists and aid workers who were, who were killed in, in Syria. Well, at the same time, French and Italian aid workers and journalists were being, um, were being uh, kidnapped, and they were not killed because they were the, the, their governments paid for them to get out. So um, uh, there's a, a different philosophy uh, uh, in operation here, um, or in Ireland, evidently, than is the case in the United Kingdom. Because the United Kingdom is trying to um, stress the whole time, and the US does the same thing, saying, do not pay the ransom. And this is where, paradoxically, the, um, uh, the whole issue of public relations by the ransomware gang becomes very important. Because if they get a reputation of once having received the money, they do actually decrypt the data as they promised they would, and they don't put it online so everyone can see it. Uh, then this, this means that companies are more inclined to pay the ransom, because it's much cheaper paying the ransom than having your entire operation effectively encrypted for time immemorial. And so there's a huge debate that rages in the cybersecurity industry and amongst governments about whether you should pay or not. The fact is, though, that hundreds of companies have paid up, uh, you know, uh, up, up to $50 million to, to, um, to retrieve, their, retrieve their data because the figures of what these you know, and the, of the big players, you're only talking about 10 big players, and of the 10 big players, you're talking about four or five. They have earned something in the region of $5 billion over the past two and a half years alone. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. So, yes, people are paying. Are pretty much all of those big players in Russian satellite 
somewhere in the orbit of Russia or uh, China? Um, w w no, I suppose not, it not matter where they are because, of course, governments have to tolerate this to some extent, don't they? Yeah, they, oh, they do, they do. Not in China. China would, it's very unlikely, and there's no evidence that China is allowing groups to uh, launch ransomware attacks. Uh, for, for, and th there's a reason for this in uh, what I call the geopolitics of, of insecurity, is, is that at the heart of, of the emerging Chinese-American competition is the tech industry uh, and tech in general. And it is not the sort of thing that China would want to muddy the waters uh, for. Russia has a slightly different uh, a approach to this. Um, we do know that some of the groups um, involved in uh, cybercrime, Darkside, for example, are either in Russia or in a country that, uh, uh, where Russia has considerable uh, considerable influence. Um, but not all of the groups operate out of Russia. What, uh, what Russia likes about the internet is it is a very low cost and an easily deniable technique for just sort of stirring a bit of trouble up. Um, you know, a, a trouble which sort of exists already. I mean, the fact is, is cybercrime and ransomware is so successful because we all operate on very, very vulnerable systems which are easily uh, broken into. And it's the same if you take the issue of Russian interference in the 2016 election in the United States. It's a similar thing. I, I think the Democrats to, uh, actually got slightly carried away with seeing you know, the Kremlin behind everything in terms, of, in terms of the defeat. And what they weren't doing is looking at the United States and all of the political vulnerabilities and anxieties and traumas in the United States. And all Russia was doing was just, you know, stirring the pot a little. Um, and it's very cheap. And as I say, it's, uh, it's deniable. So, um, uh, so, yes, I mean... This comes within the context of the fact that in the past um, 10 years, we have seen, in, in 2010, there was a big moment when the United States defined cyber as the fifth military do domain. Uh, and uh, interestingly, it's the, the only man-made military domain, but a military domain it is. And it's an area of military operations, and of course, the internet connects absolutely everything. So everything is potentially a military, is potentially a military issue. And since that date, 2010, what you've seen is something in the region of 150 countries have now develop, developed an offensive cyber capability. And there are no rules of the road uh, uh, about this. And the other thing about it is, is that and unlike nuclear, where you can identify how many nuclear warheads your enemy has, you can identify what the ballistics are which will carry those, those nuclear warheads and exactly where they're stationed. Cyber is a preemptive weapon. You have to be inside the systems of your opponent uh, if you're going to be able to deploy it successfully um, when, the, when, the, when the time comes. So all of this is sort of uh, messed up um, and difficult to disentangle. But essentially, the Russians really since the early days have had the philosophy with their criminal gangs that as long as you don't interfere with Russian state interests or security interests, then we're not going to stop you from uh, operating outside of our territory. And if we require you for uh, purposes of national security, uh, then you will jump to it. Uh, and we've actually seen some examples of where servers of criminal groups have actually been used for attacks on, on Russia's uh, enemies. Um, one of the absolute fascinations, the many fascinations of dark market, your book was that is 10 years old now, but, uh, and it's a 
it's a fabulous read. Still, I, I, I reread it um, actually when the HSE attack happens because it still is a kind of absolutely key text. But one of the things that was just absolutely fascinating was that the, the origins of so much of this in, you know, kids alone in their bedrooms um, trying to copy video games. <laughs> it starts at that sort of adolescence, literally adolescence level, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, that was a, a wonderful thing. And it, I mean, it speaks to the ingenuity and the curiosity uh, of young people in particular. And I, actually, I mean, one of the extraordinary things about coding and, and computers is it really has enriched the lives of a certain type of young person who otherwise was perhaps slightly introverted or didn't have really the same type of uh, of world that they can now enter in order to e express themselves. And it, it was fascinating when I was writing Dark Market about talking to some of these kids who, you know, at the age of 13, 14, and 15, I mean, they start by um, working out how to decrypt uh, the little keys that uh, computer video games companies had put on their tapes. I mean, they were, you know, little tape cassettes like we used to listen to music on. And uh, that's what games were were recorded on. And, um, oh, we suddenly got some uh, weird, mysterious music. It's clearly we've been hacked. Um, uh, so, uh, and they would work out how to get rid of that key so they could play the games for... Uh, for free, and they could copy them and hand them out to their uh, out to their friends. But you know, it just sort of ten or fifteen years later on, you were getting kids who were twelve, thirteen, fourteen years old, who were exploring the guts of the entire internet around the world, who were actually getting in to the Pentagon, you know, the secure parts of the the Pentagon or the uh, the CIA, and um, who were, you know, f from their perspective, they were completely liberated. This is a world about which their parents knew absolutely nothing, which held any number of secrets and which empowered them. It gave them a sense of self which they'd never had before. And one of the problems about uh, cyber vulnerability uh, around the world is, is you have just a, a, a tiny number of people who understand the technology behind, uh, behind the internet, who understand coding, who understand hacking and vulnerabilities, and who will literally go home for a weekend and read a book with hundreds of thousands of lines of code. They will literally do that. So you have that tiny little group upon whom all of our uh, all of our fates depend. Then you have a slightly bigger circle of uh, people who I call securocrats who understand the implications of what these uh, technology specialists uh, grasp. They understand the implications. And then you have a vast circle of everyone else, of the, the rest of us. And that's where the issue of dependency is so important because... It's like, you know, when we were driving a, a normal car, an internal combustion engine, most of us could change a tire. You know, if the, if the carburetor went, we could probably blow through it and get some idea. We could knock on the uh, distributor cap and it might start again. That sort of thing. We had a basic understanding of the mechanics of a, of a vehicle. But now, if your car breaks down, all you're looking at is a black box. And, you know, mechanics are more or less redundant, particularly with the move to electric vehicles. Yeah. And actually, that, that raises, I think, the, the very large issue here. Isn't it? I, I was trying to think about this historically, you know, that every technology that becomes really useful depends on ignorance, doesn't it? So yeah. for a technology to really change the world, it has to be usable by vast numbers of people who don't understand it. Right? So the you know, the Wright brothers or whatever start flying, you know, the, the people who were aviators at the beginning built planes, you know, designed them, experimented with them, fell out of them, whatever, you know, they, <laughs> they knew them. But 
you and I or, any, or anybody in the audience getting on a plane, we we, we don't we don't even think about how it works or don't don't need to. And, so, and that gap just grows and grows and grows. But it's it's so particular with information technology, isn't it? That that uh, the, the expertise, as you said, lies in the hands of very small numbers of people. And historically, governments were able to deal with experts by regulating them and by depending on self-regulation. It was a kind of mix of both, you know, say with doctors or whatever. You There are laws about what doctors can, can and cannot do, but also there's like there's medical councils who will impose internal sanctions. And neither of those two things can operate with, with IT knowledge. You, you, states cannot really regulate because... As you've spoken so eloquently about, it's a it's a, it's 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 a global business, and also there's not self regulation in the sense that there's almost an admiration, isn't there, within the culture for for the hacker, for the person who can who can breach security systems. The, 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 there's, there's there's an element of game playing that is associated from very early on with the development of this technology. Yeah, well, you raised several very important questions there. First of all, one thing that I, I, I'm afraid we've lost the battle with, but I, I still think it needs reiterating, is the word hacker uh, is actually a neutral term. It just means somebody who understands how to examine uh, computer systems and establish where their vulnerability lies. So... Uh, it's it, it's it's not negative, or it shouldn't be negative. Unfortunately, uh, in the UK and also elsewhere, with the phone hacking scandal, um, uh, the term hacking started to assume a pejorative sense. Uh, and hackers are now seen as a bad thing. But actually, hackers are also people who will look at a company's computer system and say, look, you've got this bug, you've got this bug, this, you've got this bug, you've got to do something about it. So ac actually, that, that's really what they are. But, but now uh, hacking uh, is a pejorative term, basically, because it implies uh, somehow a duplicitous entry into a, into a network system. Um, but what you said about the, uh, about the airplane was fascinating, uh, Fintan, because I was uh, recently I, I read um, Stefan Zweig's autobiography, The World from Yesterday. Um, and Zweig talks about the first decade of the 20th century and the, the latter years of the 19th century, but particularly the first decade of the 20th century, where suddenly everything was changing as a consequence of technology in ways that people couldn't keep up. And, uh, uh, it, you know, and uh, governments also were less in control of what was happening than they had been before. And as I was reading uh, these opening chapters of the Zweig, I thought, oh, my God, this is exactly the same as what's happening today, except the point that you make is, is that, Actually, many, many more people can access the internet, can use the internet uh, in nefarious or in, or in positive ways, but out of the control of governments. And so uh, the whole thing is connected, but jurisdictions are different. Uh, and so the United States may well go after a hacker in its own country who's stolen money from somebody, but they find it very difficult to do that from a hacker in Nigeria. But a hacker in Nigeria can get into an American system and then cash out the money in Dubai or wherever it is he wants to cash out the, the money. And this makes it very, very difficult uh, to track. So uh, if, if you think about it, there was a, a wonderful statistic that the FBI gave me uh, in about 2017, which was in the first six months of 2017, um, uh, 17 and a half million dollars were stolen in actual physical bank robberies, in bank raids. And in, this, in the same period, something in the region of three billion dollars had been stolen from uh, uh, people using using cyber techniques one way or another, including one hack of a of a digital 
currency exchange, a cryptocurrency exchange, uh, which netted something like half a billion. I mean, it's just the, the, the figures and the scale of this defy our comprehension. And this is one of the real problems, is, is that cyber and cybercrime is very boring. It's terribly boring, you know. Whereas if you're a news outlet, if someone not, holds up if, if someone holds up a bank, it's much more entertaining. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the simple things well, none of it's simple, but it, it, it does, it really struck me again at the time of the HSC attack, you know, I was trying to write about that in Ireland, that, mm. you know, there are the technological vulnerabilities, there's the vulnerabilities of the systems, but there's also vulnerabilities of the population mm. to damn all about, you know, and it's to do with poverty and class and marginalization and inequality and all those other things. In Ireland, 47% of the population lack basic digital skills. And this is, you know, a, a society which has 18 of the top 20 technology companies, you know, headquartered here for, for, for Europe, you know, which, which is highly educated. I mean, larger proportion of people have had third level education than in most European countries. And yet we, we, we've left behind vast numbers of people. And it's not like these people are not using the technology. They have smartphones, they, they have computers very often. But but they they just they don't understand them they don't know how to use them they, mm. they very very little sense of it so so it just took me that there, there is some sort of old fashioned obvious stuff that we can do which is the you know the boring stuff of of education and of of equipping people at least to, to be more conscious about about what they do online and and, and understanding it better yeah well it's fa it's funny you should say that Fintan, because there's uh, I mean, this is a this is a problem the the world over, but uh, it's very useful to highlight Ireland because of the advanced digital skills that this society now uh, now can boast. Um, but uh, you know, one of the biggest sectors where fraud is growing, cyber fraud is is growing, is um, amongst old people. So. I have a, a, my mother is uh, 87 and she has uh, cognitive impairment, i.e., creeping dementia. Um, but she lives on her own and looks after herself tolerably well. But she's absolutely dependent on her phone and on her uh, and on her computer. And because of the fact that she is so vulnerable to scammers and fraudsters and really doesn't know what she's doing on a computer, I have had to take control of basically most of her, remotely, of most of her digital devices to ensure that she's not, uh, you know, doing something silly. But this is a, that's, that's a, a, a huge, huge problem. And uh, it's, it's one that, uh, as far as I can see at the moment, is only going to get worse, and why it's behoven upon uh, governments and companies to introduce uh, education at school level, in my opinion, about cybersecurity. But here's the problem of going back to um, going back to uh, the fact that computers and cybersecurity are a witlessly boring subject to the majority of humankind, which they are. So, what do you do about that? Well, I was struck when. Spooks, the BBC show about MI5, um, started, you know, climbing up the ratings chart in, in the UK. Uh, and I was told by someone from MI5 that this was accompanied by suddenly a rocketing level of applications to join both MI5 and MI6 amongst all young people because they thought it was so exciting. And I suddenly realized that what you need for cybersecurity is you need really good television shows because television is the way to reach a large, a large audience. Now, we certainly found that with, with McMafia, it, it, you know, the book was fine and People liked it, but, you know, it was read by a, a, a very small minority of the world population. But the TV show, you're suddenly reaching tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of, of people. And so that way of education is really good. And there has been one show, Mr. Robot, 
um, which really got over the central problem of what do you do about popularizing things about cybercrime, which is the, the Mogadon impact of the keyboard and the screen. Um, and Mr. Robot did it very, very cleverly. So I think, I, I know that television companies are now trying to find the next Bridgerton, but with cybersecurity at the center <laughs> of it. Um, <coughs> so far, they haven't succeeded. <laughs> but that's the way to do it, unfortunately, along with education in schools. Well, we can, we can see what Misha's next project is going to be. <laughs> Sex, sex and cybersecurity mm -hmm. together. Definitely work. Um, I mean, is this also, well, I'm sure it's a stupid question, but it's obvious, it is obviously also a problem of this mismatch between the pace of globalization on the one side and the nature of global governance on the other side. Right? So, so, so clearly there's no national solution to cybersecurity problems. What have governments been doing to work transnationally and, and, and to try to have some kind of coherent international response to the problem? So this is the first time that you've seen the proliferation of uh, communications technology, which has not resulted in the uh, early emergence of a uh, international governance body. So you know, the International Telegraph Union, um, the International Broadcasting Union, uh, <clears throat> and there have been attempts uh, at the IBU and at the ITU to try and create a uh, body of global governance for the internet. Uh, there have been over the past 10 years endless um, intergovernmental uh, committees trying to establish rules of the rules of the road uh, for the internet. They have all fallen down um, <clears throat> on the differences that exist between China, Russia, and the United States and Europe. Fundamentally, those are the big four players, and actually the really big three players are China, the US, and Russia. Uh, the Europe is quite fragmented in this. They've fallen down on the different concepts of what global governance should be. So China basically says that each country should have control of its own internet and that it should allow in what it wants in and it should be able to block what it doesn't want in. And it sets the rules for what you can and can't do uh, on the internet. Uh, the United States and Russia basically agrees with that. The United States is, is that you should have uh, a free and unfettered exchange on the internet and the only things that you need to control are agreed upon uh, areas of criminality like money laundering, like child pornography and, and so on. Uh, and that there should also be rules of the road for engaging in, comp uh, in, in um, conflict. Uh, but the, a, a military conflict, but that's, that would be a separate sort of subsection. And those two positions of what the internet should look like uh, have basically never been reconciled. And that is why we have failed, even the, though the UN tries year in, year out to do this, we have failed to reach agreement. Now, it may be... Uh, and this is being incredibly optimistic, which is not something I'm very used to doing. It may be that because what we're seeing in China and Russia, and this is never reported, but it's something I've done a bit of work on, we're seeing uh, fast rising levels of domestic cybercrime, uh, uh, monetary based cybercrime in both China and Russia. Um, that there is an area where cooperation in the area of cybersecurity could be quite fruitful. That, however, will probably require a warming of relations between Beijing, Washington, and Moscow, which right now is not looking like it's on the cards. But there are informal so-called Track 1.5 and Track 2 negotiations going on between China, Russia, uh, the US and Europe, Germany in particular, which are sort of backroom uh, 
back-channel discussions between diplomats, academics, and so on, which, which are looking for areas where you could find cooperation to, to build on. But this is, um, uh, you know, compared to the influence of, uh, of competitive, the competitive relationship in most sectors uh, between China, Russia, and America, this is only a small, this is having only a small influence, but it is there. Um, let's take some questions from the audience. Um, I, I can't see you in the audience, but... Uh, we'll, I we'll can't be, really we'll, either. Oh, I can now. <laughs> it will be... Uh, a microphone going around, so I think if you if you just raise your hand to signal, I think the mic might come to you. So we'll we'll just give a, a moment for that to happen for whoever wants to ask the first question. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, what we can do as individuals and also as people maybe working in, in small businesses, what we can do to keep an eye out for um, potential hacking and, and spamming and that, because um, more and more now here we're seeing spam phone calls coming to, to people's mobiles and um, more spam emails, that a lot of which look very professional and using company logos and everything. And you're nearly afraid to click on a link or to, to open anything um, that might cause potential harm. So I'm just curious as to both as individuals and as, as small companies, what we can do, what you think we can do or, or look out for. Um, it's a very good question. There's actually a, a great deal that everyone can do um, to protect themselves because uh, really, uh, about, uh, you know, 97, 98% of attacks are opportunistic. And through proper digital hygiene, you can prevent yourself falling, victims to, uh, falling victim to those opportunistic uh, attacks. The 2 to 3%, which are very carefully targeted attacks, more sophisticated attacks, it's 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 difficult to uh, to prevent, um, but uh, but there are ways which I'll I'll explain in a sec. But first of all, the basic thing is is that um, people have to understand that they must always update the software when um, requested to, whether it's Windows or whether it's uh, Mac uh, or Linux. It, 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 Linux. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. The reason why you have to do that is often those updates are because a vulnerability has been found and is being used by a group somewhere, and you must close it down in your computer. So that's the first thing. Second thing is to use for the moment uh, a password manager. Don't use your own uh, your own brain as a as a store of passwords. Use a password manager. There are loads of them. They're all free. Uh, antivirus uh, program is absolutely essential. Um, and also, if you use a, a, a VPN, this may sound to some people gobbledygook, but these are all very simple software programs, uh, which actually, if you deploy, reduce your vulnerability tremendously, and they're easy to find out about. Virtual private network is a VPN. They're also very useful for spoofing for spoofing which country you're in. So uh, <clears throat> I, I often, whenever I go abroad uh, and I want to watch the BBC, I use my VPN and say that I'm actually in England and I can watch the BBC. So and that's a very handy little tool to have, but uh, I digress. Um, <clears throat> if you're in a small uh, company, um, the crown jewels, keep them separate, keep them uh, offline. You must have somebody managing your systems, and this has become acute since the pandemic because the effect of everyone working from home has been to uh, expand what we call the attack vector um, <clears throat> because uh, you're taking your computer home and you might have a sort of 10-year-old uh, 
playing around on it. Um, uh, and that means they can possibly infect the system, which then goes back to the central system and the whole thing is, uh, the whole thing is, is done. So you have, to, um, you have to learn how to read your computer with the, the phone scams, with the, the text and everything. You know, if it's, uh, if it's somebody who's threatening you with the, with the tax authorities, if it's somebody saying that, you know, um, uh, you've, uh, um, uh, you've uh, committed some violation or whatever, just ignore it straight away. And if you see things which you think are slightly odd, have a look and see exactly where that email or what that phone number is, because that will tell you that it's not from Microsoft, it's actually from a slightly different uh, address. And what you really need, if you've got more than about 10 people in a company, you need to have somebody to manage your IT systems with advanced cybersecurity ability. Uh, and. Uh, this is the thing which, in, including the Irish, uh, Irish health executive, has not understood, is you are not saving money by, um, uh, by refusing to invest in your cybersecurity systems and the personnel, the information security officers who, who run those systems. There are some things which you can't, it's very difficult to do anything about, and that is, a lot of attacks are caused by what's called the insider threat of somebody who's disgruntled, an employee or whatever, who will actually allow a group in in order to get back at the company. That's to do with how you manage your human resources, and it's a, it's a slightly different issue, but it's an important one. Uh, but essentially, um, keep, uh, uh, maintain your digital hygiene, uh, which is really not too difficult to do. And if you're, um, if you're with a company with more than 10 employees or so, make sure that you have an information security officer who really knows what they're doing. Thank you very much. Have we got another question? We do. I'm speaking from a position of relative ignorance here, but one of the things that's being touted as being more secure is the whole concept of blockchain. Is that actually more secure, or is it in a few years going to be equally vulnerable? Well, a, a blockchain is less to do with security and more to do with transparency, um, uh, which is a which is a good thing. And uh, when blockchain technology is deployed, particularly in the signing of contracts, um, which is where much of the growth of blockchain technology is going on beyond the cryptocurrency network, what that means is that for complex contract work, it will be very, very difficult for people to uh, claim uh, to basically defraud um, a, a contract because everything will be um, uh, uh, everything will be available for everyone to see at every step of the way. So, um, uh, in theory, blockchain technology with cryptocurrency, Bitcoin runs on a block on blockchain technology enables the police to see where all transactions have taken place and who has been involved in them. Um, but what we've discovered early on with Bitcoin is, is that uh, criminals found ways of disguising their particular transactions. And uh, so uh, using a system called a tumbler, I won't go into the details of it, but it basically renders it much more difficult to identify who is buying and selling that particular uh, Bitcoin. So I wouldn't see at the moment um, Bitcoin, uh, blockchain as uh, a security device, 
but it is a transparency device which may well help when it comes to things like money laundering in the future and trying to combat money laundering. So, so it does have a security aspect to it, but it's not something that is going to help you keep people out of your systems. Thank you very much. Have we another question? Just big picture, I suppose. Are we ever going to get out of this um, security problem with the with the internet? It's fallen into, you know, the personal. The, well, I, I understand that the HSE attack fe fell into a very innocuous action by somebody, and it crippled the country for so long. Excuse the the pun, but. Uh, where are we going to go with the big picture? Are we ever going to get away from it? Well, um, I, I have this thing. Uh, I, I refer to the four horsemen of the modern apocalypse, um, which is climate change, pandemics, which is the only one which was also the original apocalypse as well, um, weapons of mass destruction, and uh, our over-dependency on on uh, network computer systems. Uh, and that's why it was really good to, hi to highlight the, the attack on the Irish health system uh, f first of all. Uh, unfortunately, what drives innovation is people's desire for the latest shiny um, device which increases convenience. Um, into which security is not, is not built. And more and more of our systems, uh, the entire, all of our utilities, whether it's water, uh, whether it's electricity, whether it's gas, they are all run on very complicated network systems. And in December 2015, for the first time, uh, a group of hackers brought down part of the electric grid in Western Ukraine. And this should have been a warning sign that things are running out of control. The Irish attack is another warning sign. So is Colonial Pipeline, regardless of who or why they committed it. Now, the only way that we are going to be able to combat this is through international cooperation. And that's why I find the whole issue of scaling up our dependency on the internet very disturbing because I don't see the um, constellation uh, lining up which will allow for uh, a proper debate about how we go forward as a, as a planet. All of those four issues I mentioned are planetary issues. And uh, at the moment, we are retreating from most forms of global cooperation. Uh, and uh, that's why I'm very, very concerned about the whole thing. So I don't see any easy, easy answers to that unless you see more grown-up approaches from, from uh, the biggest players of all. We'll take another question from the audience, but can I just jump in, Michelle, and ask you, yeah. I suppose, you know, because it's standing out really as something we haven't talked about, which is the responsibility of the global tech giants themselves. You know, so we... The, the, the way in which the internet developed was largely through a process of privatization, a kind of wild west, and, and we allowed companies like Facebook and Google to acquire astonishing power over us um, through through their control of these technologies. But what responsibility do they have, and, and, and have they done anything to meet those responsibilities? Well, I, in terms of uh, security, probably l less so. Um, but in terms of the culture that they have nurtured, I think they have tremendous responsibility. Um, I, I think it's a different era. I think we're moving into Shoshana Zuboff's, um, uh, what, what was the book called? Um, surveillance Capitalism. Yeah, Surveillance Capitalism. So what we're, what we're looking at is, is the commodification of human beings, um, the data commodification of human beings. And I think that is happening, uh, that is happening apace. What's, what's interesting is to see, uh, and there, uh, you know, I think there should be an antitrust 
initiative against Google and Facebook and Twitter and all the all the rest of them. And frankly, you know, Amazon and um, uh, and uh, uh, Microsoft and so on. What's interesting is what's been happening in China in the past six months is you've seen Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership move against the big tech operators inside China, like uh, Jack Ma, uh, who runs Alibaba. Uh, and uh, w what, what I find curious is why are the Chinese doing this? Is it because tech giants are inherently an alternative center of power which threatens the Communist Party's control of, uh, of China? Uh, is it because the Chinese government is developing such a sophisticated form of surveillance of its own population that it wants these operations subordinated to them on a, from a technical point of view? Um, uh, I, 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 I don't know, but I, I, I do suspect that China looks at Washington and Silicon Valley and says these companies have far too much influence over Washington and over tech policy um, and we can't allow that to happen here. That will be one, one aspect of their, cons their consideration. What's really interesting, of course, Fintan, is, is when you see the hearings with people like Zuckerberg um, uh, is that uh, the advantage that Silicon Valley has is, is that political um, assemblies, whether it's Congress, whether it's Parliament in the UK or wherever, uh, simply do not understand the technology and the complexity and sophistication of the commercial and technical worlds that these people are building. So they're always behind, uh, behind the curve. And that gives the tech companies a hell of a lot to play with uh, as they expand their operations and, and influence. I think we have time for just one last question from the audience. So whoever's next, I'm afraid that's going to have to be the last one. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to get one, Fintan. Um, okay. Call me old fashioned, but uh, oh, yeah, we do have one. Uh, my question is a simple one. Are, are we ourselves to blame? Oh. <laughs> I think that's the, that's, that's the hardest of the lot. I, I would say our willingness to accept uh, the technology and all its implications um, bears, we, we bear part of the responsibility, but remember, in the 1990s, when this technology was emerging in the Western world as uh, um, you know, uh, affecting large numbers of people, um, we were all very excited by it, A. And B, in the very early days, the proselytizers, n not when it was emerging in the American military in the 1970s and 1980s, but the proselytizers in the 1990s, particularly on the, on the West Coast, and it was picked up by a lot of uh, sort of nerds and techno fans in Europe, were basically, um, they were techno optimists who saw this, who saw the internet uh, as a way of liberating ourselves from the influence of government and of uh, big business and commercial interests. They saw it as a democratizing instrument. It was, a, I highly recommend that you go back and read John Perry Barlow, who was the sort of guru of uh, these people. He wrote a, a manifesto on cyber, cyberspace in 1996. It's only about a page long. Um, but it's written in this uh, rather sort of faux biblical uh, language, uh, saying, <clears throat> ye giants of the past, governments and corporations, ye shall be banished from our world. Uh, we, we, your presence is not, is not wanted here. 
talking about the internet, saying that this was going to be an area where we would essentially find an, an anarchist u utopia. And there are echoes of that anarchy amongst the hacking community, which is still uh, actually still quite common, that this is a way of liberating yourself from government and commercial interests. But uh, unfortunately, within about two or three years of John Perry Barlow's manifesto, I think most governments around the world realized that this was far too powerful an instrument to leave in the hands of ordinary people. And so they started colonizing it in a very systematic and effective way. So uh, possibly, um, but you know, we're only ordinary people trying to struggle to, to make a crust day in, day out. And it's very difficult to understand what the implications are of uh, a mobile phone in which you can get your email and play Candy Crush. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one person who is certainly not to blame is, is Mr. Glenny. Um, Misha has been um, so prescient, so illuminating, um, and unfortunately so right. Um, I think Misha used the word... Um, that he was going to allow himself some optimism earlier on, but it didn't last that long. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, perhaps if more people had paid attention to what Michelle was writing about 10 years ago, uh, we, 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 we might not be quite in the dilemma that we're in. Nevertheless, um, we know from all human problems that, um, that transparency, that, that the, the desire to explain and communicate and educate um, really is the ultimate solution um, and, and nobody has done more to do those things for us um, and therefore to give us at least some hope, some, some sense that we can get a grasp of, of, of what these problems are um, than then, 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 then Misha has done and it's been what a privilege um, to, to have over the last hour his, his eloquence and his, his insights. Um, so on your behalf, I'd just like to thank him so much for his, for his generosity.